title of my talk is about mapping and monitoring forest pests, but we are going to talk pretty much exclusively about gypsy moth today. Uh, Joe mentioned gypsy moth this morning, but since he didn't delve too deeply into what's been going on with gypsy moth in New England the past few years, I'm going to give everyone a brief overview so we're on the same page. Uh, gypsy moth is a very long established invader. We first had signs of gypsy moth in uh, late 1860s, actually a Frenchman who thought he could crossbreed gypsy moth and silkworms to create a new silk industry, and he had a caterpillar escape out his bedroom window in Medford, and so it began. And back in the early days, we're looking 1890 to 1905, there were some pretty extreme control efforts. They really did try and get a handle on this uh, quickly. They were burning things, spraying chemicals on things, uh, but nothing really worked, including a handful of biocontrols. There were 10 different species of parasitoids established and none of them really took. So gypsy moth continued to spread. And we can see in this series of maps going from, you know, just the Massachusetts introduction at the turn of the century, all the way through most of the Northeast uh, by 2007. Gypsy moth uh, undergoes a kind of cyclic outbreak here. We can see on this graph of uh, the acres defoliated versus year uh, that we get some spikes kind of periodically. Prior to 1981, uh, there were regular, like, regular outbreaks about every 10 years. However, in 1989, we had a fungal pathogen, um, uh, Entomophaga mymija that ended this cycle. So effective biocontrol, things are working. We're no longer seeing these massive defoliation events. The cycle seems to have ended, or so we thought. In 2016, Gypsy Moth was all over the news. And that's actually how I first started into this project was it was a current event. Um, I'll tell you where I come in in just a minute, but we're seeing all these reports of massive defoliation across the state of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. And it turns out that after three abnormally dry springs, 2014, 15, and 16, does not make for a happy fungus population. And so our very effective biocontrol that had us in this real good place with gypsy moth was failing. And I gave this talk back in March. Our prognosis at that point for 2017 was even if the rainfall got back up to normal, the amount of egg masses coming out of 2016, we were going to be seeing an outbreak this year um, and possibly years into the future. And so I just pulled this up the other day. Back in January, um, Massachusetts state agencies, I think this is from DCR, but issued warnings. Basically saying we're anticipating another big outbreak, even bigger than 2016. And if anyone's been following the news this year, yet again, we are seeing reports. Gypsy moths stay strong, promising another triumphant showing. The caterpillars are back and shouldn't be ignored. Just to give you some perspective, since I know not everyone is from southern New England, um, I took these pictures at the Quabbin at Joe's recommendation to go out and see this epic outbreak firsthand. Uh, just towards the end of June, I believe. And this is scanning around a uh, kind of little pathway right by the visitor center. You can see it looks like early spring. There's no leaves on the tree, but understory is green. It is midsummer. All of those trees should have plenty of leaves, and they do not. Um, kind of another perspective here. This is on Route 202 next to the Quabbin. And video quality is not great, but kind of looking up angular, anywhere that's kind of that grayish tone, complete defoliation, mostly deciduous species, um, which are gypsy moths prefer oak uh, of all the deciduous, but they'll eat anything if they get hungry enough. So massive amounts of defoliation. Question becomes, we can see it really clearly on the ground. We know what's happening, people are reporting it. We can see the caterpillars, we can see the shards of leaves, the grass, the naked trees. But how do we actually map this and monitoring, monitor it over large scales? Traditionally, Forest Service has used aerial sketch maps. And when I say aerial sketch maps, I literally mean a guy sitting in a plane, flying over portions of the state. You can see a nice picture there uh, with a tablet, hand drawing these patches of defoliation. And you can get some pretty good maps out of this. This is a 2016 damage map for Massachusetts from the aerial survey. See those big blobby polygons kind of spread across the state there. 
However, aerial sketch mapping costs a lot of money to do. You've got to put planes up in the sky, employ people who are capable of doing sketch mapping. It's time intensive, can't cover a lot of ground in any given day, which means that you're getting a wide range of survey dates. I've seen everything from early June all the way through late August. And you can imagine that um, a critter like the gypsy moth that has a distinct life history emerge in late May, get little caterpillars, they're kind of peaking defoliation in mid to late June, and then we start to see the trees refoliating after these defoliation events. It's really complicated to map it, especially when you've got all these different points in time, which is where I came in. So my background's actually in satellite remote sensing. I use imagery acquired from spaceboard instruments to look at all sorts of ecological dynamics. And so when the gypsy moth outbreak started in 2016, we were like, okay, let's see if we can do this using satellite data. And going back into the literature, it actually turns out people have been trying to map gypsy moths with satellite data going all the way back. This is the earliest record I have uh, using 1973 imagery from Landsat 1. We'll get into Landsat in just a minute. But this has been a long-standing application of this sort of data. Like I said, I use a sensor called Landsat. We've had a whole series of Landsat satellites uh, over the years. You know, nice bar chart up there. So Landsat 1 launched in 72. Next year, someone's trying to map gypsy moth with it. Those studies were done in Pennsylvania in collaboration with Goddard. Uh, but what's interesting about the Landsat program is that it wasn't until 2008 that we actually gained access to this full record of data. Prior to 2008, you had to buy your imagery. It was really expensive. So a lot of what people were doing was they'd say, this is a year that we do see defoliation. This is a year we didn't. Compare the two, and you'd start to make these maps. However, now that we have access to everything, our techniques are rapidly changing. We're starting to look a lot more at the full set of observations. And I'll show some pictures of that in a minute. But it's kind of a shift in how we've been thinking about this Landsat archive. For those of you who aren't familiar with Landsat, which I imagine is <laughs> many of us, um, Landsat is a 30 meter spatial resolution. So we have a nice uh, contrast here, an aerial photo, typically 15 to 30 centimeters. We're seeing individual yeah. trees, houses, driveways. This is the exact same location in a Landsat image. True color, uh, so I mean, seeing the same kind of spectral data that's in this image, but it's big blurry. So I don't see individual trees. I get kind of an average reflectance signal over this larger area. However, Landsat has this advantage of not just seeing what your naked eye can see, red, green, and blue, the visible portion. We also have bands in the near infrared, shortwave infrared, and thermal infrared. I like this figure because it kind of illustrates those nicely, although admittedly, the different Landsats all have different bands and so wavelength, so it's a little more complicated, but you don't need to get too far into that. Here's the big thing. We have a 16-day revisit time, which means that, like I said, if you're working with one or two images, there's a lot more in that long uh, record. And so 16-day revisit on any individual Landsat, we get eight days and we have two. Right now we have two. It's great. Um, and you can start putting together pictures. This is a composite for the full U.S. And I like to show this just to point out the satellite is acquiring in strips. And so kind of a little similar to those aerial problems, we don't always get the exact same dates for the same place, but we do get a much more regular repeat than you can accomplish with an aerial um, survey. So finally, a time series. So this is what it looks like when you look at every available Landsat observation, every clear Landsat observation, I should say, because we take out anything that's cloudy or otherwise um, experiencing any sort of noise that we can mask. But uh, here's our full time series. and uh, through different spectral indices, so using those different spectral bands to kind of look at different signals. And down at the bottom here are a number of observations across the years. You can see when we have a single sensor uh, in the pre-1999 era, uh, we get far fewer than post-99 when we uh, consistently had two Landsats in operation. And so, kind of wrapping up the intro here, I like to think of these time series as kind of the Keeling curve of ecosystem dynamics. A couple of people have shown the Keeling curve already. Keeling curve is one point. We've talked about Mauna Loa. It's up there on the mountain measuring carbon dioxide. We are measuring these time series for every pixel on the surface of the Earth. And just to put that in perspective, Massachusetts alone is over 23 million pixels. So this is an incredibly rich archive of temporal information. 
So where does the gypsy moth come in? This is a nice uh, schematic actually for a different sensor, but the general idea is the same. We just talked about phenology, so couldn't have been more perfect lead in. Uh, this is kind of the expected phenology of uh, defoliated versus non-defoliated forest. So if we're thinking in terms of, we call them vegetation indices, uh, spectral properties that are sensitive to how much green stuff we have uh, vegetation. And over time, so seasonally, we expect, you know, winter in New England, not a lot of green. It's going to increase, reach some sort of peak. We always have some sort of defoliation, declining leaf health after green up. So we'll expect to see some sort of natural decline um, and then tapering off back into the fall. If we have a uh, defoliation event, we'll expect kind of a dip in there and then some possible refoliation. So this is kind of our generalized figure. And what we did uh, using the time series approach was we actually built a series of models that help us understand what a forest should look like. So they're harmonic models, which just means it has a regular cycle to it. Um, and we fit these models for a period of time that we consider relatively stable. Here in New England, we chose 2005 to uh, 2011. So the solid line here is a harmonic model fit to all of those observations. They're color coded by the time of year they were acquired, kind of helps you sort out what you're looking at. So blue is winter, uh, teal in spring, uh, green in summer, and then yellow in uh, fall. And you can see that model fits pretty well to the observations. And then when the dotted line begins, we start predicting. And here's our gypsum moth defoliation in 2016. And what you're seeing is that those summer observations, which are usually way up here towards the peak of those models, are now way below. And so what we developed was this very simple indice where we basically say if the observed image and the predicted image, let's difference them and see how far apart they are uh, spectrally. And this is, in, again, a vegetation-sensitive index. And then we divide it by root mean square error basically to say how much is that difference above the normal expected variability in the model. So there's always some noise in there, but how much is this observed predicted difference uh, compared to that? And usually it's pretty big. So using this approach, I just want to kind of step through before I show you the really cool data bit, or maybe not cool because we're looking at outbreaks, but um, to kind of show our general workflow, we begin with this modeling where we're taking that historic record, we're fitting a model to understand what we think a forest should look like. We enter a monitoring stage as soon as the outbreak season begins. This year we started uh, trying to download our imagery in uh, late May and we're still kind of in monitoring right now for 2017. Each time we get a new image acquired, we generate these predicted images based on those model fits, compare the two, and then we get what we call near real-time products show you a few. They're very messy. They've got clouds in them, so they're missing data, but they give us little snapshots of what we think uh, the damage is looking like at any given point in time. Finally, we get to the end of the season, or when we get enough data, I've got a few of these already just to get a sense for a bigger picture, we can start to average. So we get multiple looks of the same place. We can start to combine them and make a very pretty seamless map. And finally, we've got a lot of thoughts on how we could possibly use some of the near real-time information to start uh, integrating with the aerial and field surveys, and I'll get into that a bit later. So, some data. This was our 2016 map, skipping all that near real-time. This is the season integrated pro product, so this is the average uh, deviation from normal, let's say, uh, in 2016. And so, anywhere in blue, was pretty close to what it normally looks like within the normal realm of uh, variability. But those red tones and the oranges and yellows, the closer to red you are, the more different you were from normal. And we can see large area of defoliation uh, covering most of Rhode Island, extending up into Massachusetts. We've got some big patches in Connecticut, um, down kind of closer the ocean here, as well as kind of headed out towards the Cape. There's also a bunch of defoliation we're aware of out on the Cape, but currently working on these are two lands that we call them scenes, the footprints, so two different scenes here, and we just haven't extended into additional uh, scene data sets. So 2016 was a big year. I just wanted to point out really quickly, tying back to the aerial sketch map, just finished a study comparing uh, the approach I use to those sketch maps, and so those big blobby polygons the guy was drawing flying over, that's uh, what's kind of transparent here would be what the polygon said was mapped as damaged, and underneath that is what my map said 
was Mapta's damage. And you can see we're getting a much more precise estimate. We're also getting kind of an estimate of magnitude. So it's not just where it was damaged, but do we can we actually gauge uh, how different it was from those normal forest conditions? And so breaking news, this is the first time I'm showing these results publicly, but we are midway through 2017 monitoring. Again, a picture from the Quabbin. You can see that hillside, lots and lots of trees with no leaves, even though it's mid-June. And here we go. So these are near real-time estimates. You'll notice they're incomplete. Uh, there's a giant cloud in this one, so we're missing kind of the whole bottom part of Connecticut there. Uh, but as of the 20th of May, we're seeing mostly blue, not a lot of damage. 21st of May, we've got a little bit of uh, some yellow showing up over here. And honestly, I believe this is mostly just noise. There's a cloud offshore, and I think there was some masking issues there. But by the time we hit June 13th, which is our next good look, and um, I'll also point out all of this black area masked in here is just non-forest. This is all agriculture in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, but we're starting to see those reds and oranges showing up over quite a large area. And I'm going to kind of step through these. Each acquisition that's coming in, we're generating a new map. And we're starting to paint a picture of a heck of a lot of damage in 2017. So all the way through the end of June, started getting some new data in July. And I think, yeah, so our last estimate, July 16th. Then I took all of those data points we have so far. So we're not done yet, but what we have so far and average them just to give us one, a, a more complete picture without the clouds and um, other data issues, it's a lot of damage. And I keep telling people this, like I looked at these maps and I reprocessed my data twice because I was convinced I had to be doing something wrong until I talked to Joe and he said, no, it's really that bad. <laughs> so. This is our current best estimate of the extent of damage in 2017. Um, just to point out, again, this is an average, so this is a map showing how many observations. We're doing this at a pixel scale, so it's variable. Um, where the clouds are, seen to, or image to image can change quite a bit. Uh, we also have observations kind of in this middle area where it's uh, recorded in both Landsat pads, so we get double the number of observations. And so out in Western Mass, we have very few observations to base our averages on, sometimes just the one. So I'm not entirely confident in these estimates yet. I think they're giving us a good idea, but I'm looking forward to getting some more images and kind of refining our results, getting rid of some of the noise. Um, going back to that same image of the mean, I think it's interesting to compare 2016 and 2017. So if we kind of flip back and forth, um, things to notice. If you look here in Rhode Island, what was kind of the most severe damage in 2016 seems to have kind of migrated outwards in 2017, which is interesting to think about in terms of spread dynamics. Um, also seeing a lot of places, so this kind of little patch from 2016 becomes a much, much larger patch in 2017. So we're seeing kind of uh, seeing where populations might have been isolated and how they're, they're spreading through time. And last thing to point out, there's a lot of people saying this, this outbreak would be the worst uh, since 1981. So this is our aerial sketch map from 81. And again, big blobby polygons done with aerial uh, surveys. So not entirely sure I trust all of that. But if we flip back and forth here, we can see, um, especially kind of in this area of mass, looking at just mass here, we're not seeing defoliation yet, but again, not totally sure. I trust the aerial sketch to be completely spot on. So we may continue to see um, refinements in these estimates, but I think at this point, this is a very good picture of the total extent of damage that we are looking at. And so just to sum up, Gypsy moths have reemerged as a major forest pest. We've talked a little bit about biocontrols as a hopeful future, but things like a drought can come into play and undermine the success of what was kind of a long-standing, uh, well-working biocontrol. So dynamics in the climate system can continue to result in some surprising interactions. Things like Landsat time series, uh, there are other sensors out there that can be integrated with Landsat, are definitely improving our ability to monitor these sorts of outbreaks. Like I said, we're in a new era of remote sensing where we have access to more data than we've ever had before. And there's so many exciting things like this that are new to us and completely untapped. So I'm really excited to see where this is going to head. 
we could modify this approach for other defoliators. I'm looking forward to working with Joe when we stop near real-time monitoring gypsy moths and seeing if we can pick up on winter moth damage, which has a slightly different timing, so earlier uh, in the season, if we can see that by adjusting when we're looking at our models. And I pointed out in my kind of flow diagram before the aerial and ground surveys. I don't see this as a replacement for aerial surveys. I think that there's a great opportunity to integrate what we're seeing in the satellite imagers, especially those near real time uh, assessments, and then sending out targeted ground survey crews or aerial sketch crews to really confirm that what we're seeing is gypsy moth damage and get a better understanding of specific sites rather than trying to map the whole state uh, with an aerial approach. And finally, kind of already said this, but huge potential for these remote sensing ap approaches to improve both how we manage pests and how we model uh, invasion risk, uh, spread of pests, uh, even how the biocontrols are targeted. Uh, I've been told that there's potential to go out and introduce some of the biocontrols or fungal spores in places that are being impacted based on the real time results. So that's really exciting. We could do something actionable uh, from these assessments. And so with that, I'm going to stop. We've left enough time for questions. Um, my contact is up there. And also, uh, the paper is literally on my to-do list for this weekend. It should be in press by next week. Uh, if you want to read more about the methods and look more closely at those 2016 results was really the focus of this. But uh, it will be open access, so everyone here should be able to take a peek if they're interested. And feel free to get in touch if you think of questions later. And we'll take a few questions. Next.